thirtieth, which is eleven sixtieths. Uh, so it's important to note that when you scale the set, the density also scales by an inverse amount. It's it's easy to prove that, and it's sort of intuitive, but it's something you need to make note of. So so yeah, we we could attack the problem this way, but there's the problem that density doesn't always exist. So for example, if the set T is positive integers with an odd number of binary bits, then this T doesn't actually have a defined density. Uh, it oscillates between two thirds and one third forever like this. So this is, uh, this is just plotting the uh, relative proportion of the first however many integers that are in this set T. You can see it just goes up and down forever between these two lines. But uh, to get around that, we can define some better densities later but uh for that this is the reason why this talk is going to be split into two parts so first we're going to be proving some results while assuming that the set s has a density and in the second half of the talk we're going to be throwing that assumption out and seeing what changes uh, and it will get weirder okay so we are going to start off by trying to come up with the best example set s that we possibly can so this is this is a, a good first way to approach a problem is just play around with it see what numbers fall out uh, and you know we're, we're just going to see how well we can do so we start with the the best number we could include which is one and then inclusion of one in the set means well we can't have two or three so we cross those ones out uh, smallest number we can include is you know, four so we throw that in uh, and 4 throws out 8 and 12, but it also throws out 6, because if we had both 4 and 6, then 2 times 6 is 12, 3 times 4 is 12, we would have a collision between 2s and 3s, and we don't want that. So we throw 6 out too. Uh, next one we include is 5, then 7, 9, 11, and we can keep going like this. Uh, if we look at this set really hard, or we look it up in the OEIS, it wasn't in the OEIS, it is now. Uh, this is the set we obtain. So it's the set of every integer which is divisible by two an even number of times and divisible by three an even number of times. Uh, the set has density exactly a half, and the density of the union, S union 2S union 3S, is 11 twelfths. So the question now becomes, can we improve this? Uh, it's a greedy algorithm, so your first instinct may say, Probably not, um, but we have to prove that, right? When the set has a density, this is the best we can do. Uh, so that's the goal of my my part of the talk here. We're going to prove that this greedy set is actually the best one we could possibly pick. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to prove this lemma, which is sort of related. So. Whenever I write b, I mean a set of integers which only have prime factors 2 and 3. So just powers of 2 times powers of 3. But we have the same disjointness condition, right? b, 2b, and 3b are all disjoint. Uh, then the sum of the inverses of elements in b is at most 3 halves. And this is a very, very slight improvement over the easier bound of 18 over 11. Uh, and that bound comes from being like, OK, well, the sum of inverses plus half the sum of inverses plus a third of the sum of inverses is less than or equal to so and so and reasoning from there. OK, so how, how are we going to obtain this bound? What we're going to do is first write down all these uh, integers that could be in B in this sort of infinite grid, right? So the powers of 2 are along the x-axis, powers of 3 are along the y-axis. And then we're also going to color these diagonals in alternating colors, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, whatever. Uh, and I'm also going to write Q sub N for the inverse sum over that diagonal row. Um, so every even Q sub N is going to be a blue line, and every odd is going to be a red line. And what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a nice bound for the inverse sum over both the blue and red line in pairs. And then when we add that up over all possible pairs, we get the correct bound for the sum in general, right? Okay. 
So the one thing we need to notice here, uh, let's say we have whatever elements are chosen in this blue line here. If we shift that to the right, it's the same thing as multiplying by two, and we won't have any collisions. So those will slot into the red line without duplicating anything, right? And we can do the same thing with shifting it upwards, and that'll that'll line up in there. And we can do that at the same time. So the red line, that sum, plus half the sum of uh, q sub 2k plus a third of the sum of q sub 2k, all of that will be at most the total possible inverse sum of all the elements on this red line. That's this equation here. So q sub 2k is the blue line, q sub 2k plus 1 is the, the corresponding next red line. Uh, so we have this inequality here. So uh, the right-hand side is just the total sum over this red line here. OK. Uh, now, what we need to do is notice that 1 half plus 1 third is strictly less than 1. So we can add a positive coefficient of q sub 2k to both sides and obtain the inverse sum over the red and blue line together on the left side. Uh, that's what that looks like. So this, this bottom inequality, q standing for the sum over the red plus blue line, uh, is less than or equal to this somewhat gross looking sum. But the important part is that the right hand side here, this coefficient on q sub 2k is positive. So in order to get the best possible bound out of this, all we have to do is maximize q sub 2k and then see what happens on the right hand side. OK, uh, so in order to maximize q sub 2k, we're, we're just trying to get the highest possible sum over this one diagonal line, right? Uh, that's a much easier problem, especially because all the elements in this line are like they're in order and they're they don't interfere with each other very much. So in order to maximize the sum over q sub 2k, we can essentially ignore everything outside of it and pretend that there won't be any adjacent elements to cause problems there, right? So we can just do whatever we want inside of this line. So let's say this is our initial configuration for q sub 2k. We're going to see how we can improve it. Uh, well, inverse sums will increase if we replace a number with a smaller number. So we can slide this 24 down to 16 and improve the sum. It's now bigger than it was before. Uh, we look up and we see 81 is very big, and we can slide that one down. And we can slide it down again. But then we can't, because this 24 here, if we had that as a member, then 48 would be equal to 3 times 16 and 2 times 24. Uh, so that would be a collision. So we have to have this gap here, right? Uh, then we just pop 81 back in at the top. So so the idea here is uh, any maximal configuration will always look like this. In fact, it is this. Uh, so we've, we've maximized q sub 2k. OK. Uh, now, what does this, hold on, this sum at the bottom right, what does that look like now? Is it nice? Uh, what we're going to do is, with this maximal configuration, that uh, one half plus one third that that is being subtracted of this, that is, if we look at where the numbers land, it's just it consists of every single red row, right? So for this this blue line here, uh, if we take a half times that and we take a third times that, we get every single element on this next red row exactly once. Uh, but that's also a coefficient in our equation, right? This is another way to look at it here. So each each element that's on this grid covers that exactly once. So what this means is this minus a half minus a third times max q sub 2k, and this first, equi or first uh, term in the bound completely cancel, and we just get max q sub 2k on the right-hand side. Uh, so what that means is the total sum over the blue and corresponding red line is maximized when the red line is empty and the blue line is maximized, which uh, is kind of interesting that it favors such a regular configuration there. OK. Uh, so the set B for which the sum of the inverses is maximal is just 2 to the 2 times anything 
three to the three times or two times anything. So the uh, exponents in two and three are even. Uh, and the sum is geometric, easy to work out, it's three halves. Uh, it should ring a bell because this is also the set of coefficients that pop up in uh, the greedy set, right? The, these, this is the set of three smooth parts. Okay, so we, we solved a problem, but it's not the problem we were interested in. So we're going to relate the density of S in our previous problem to a sum like this. And in order to do that, we're going to use logarithmic density. So here's the definition. Uh, you can think of it just the same way as normal density. Uh, treat the log n like a harmonic number of n. And then this is basically just weighting every single element in x by its inverse. Uh, the fact that they're weighted that way means it's a little bit less sensitive to small perturbations in the set. So uh, normal density lines up perfectly. If, if a set has a density, it has a logarithmic density, and they're the same. But there are some sets that have a log logarithmic density that did not have a density before. So uh, the, the example before, if t was a set of positive integers with an odd number of binary bits, uh, it has logarithmic density a half, which is very nice. It doesn't oscillate. OK. Uh, so we're going to start by writing each element of s, so same disjointness condition as before, uh, in the form a times 2 to the i times 3 to the j, where a is co prime to six. So we're going to call each a, a seed, since the uh, disjointness condition really doesn't interact over different seeds. It only cares about uh, each one in particular. So the set of all seeds has density a third, which is easy. OK. Uh, so for each seed a, you collect all the elements of s with that seed into a set that looks like a times b sub a. And b sub a is the set of all those 2 to the i, 3 to the j parts that correspond to elements of s. Uh, and also, b sub a, 2b sub a, and 3b sub a are disjoint, which is fantastic. Uh, so we're going to pick some big n, and we're going to find a nice upper bound on this inverse sum of the elements of s up to n. And then when we have that bound, we'll be able to easily get a bound on the logarithmic density. OK, so uh, this union here, we can write s as the union of a, b sub a over all the seeds. And it's this disjoint union. Uh, so we can just directly translate it into a sum like this. Uh, so the sum of the inverses of the elements of s up to n is the sum over all the seeds of this sum 1 over a, b. So a is a seed, b is the 2 to the i, 3 to the j bit. And uh, we can just write it like this. So uh, summing over all the seeds less than or equal to n of 1 over a times this inverse sum of elements of b. And this inner bit looks really nice because we already have a bound on that that's actually independent of what limit we're searching up to. So we can actually just bound this inner bit by 3 halves and then see what happens, right? So the inner sum there is bounded by 3 halves, independent of a and n. Uh, so we actually have the inverse sum of elements of s up to n is at most 3 halves the same sum over the seeds. OK. Uh, at this point, all we need to do is divide by log n and then uh, take lim sup, basically. Uh, or actually lim, because we know it converges, because we're assuming that the set s has a density, right? So we uh, divide by log n, take the limit. Uh, we get 3 halves times the logarithmic density of the seeds on the right, and we get the logarithmic density of s on the left. OK. So the logarithmic density of s is bounded above by 3 halves the logarithmic density of the seeds. And the seeds, we know, have a density. And it's a third. And a third times 3 halves is a half, which is the same density that we obtained in the greedy set. Uh, and then we also, of course, get that the density of the union has to be at most 11 twelfths, right? Uh, so by greedily adding our elements, we obtain the densest possible union uh, only when we assume that the set has a density. So these arguments completely fail in the, in the case that we don't assume it has a density. So this is basically just a bound on log, log density. And it just so happens that when we assume it does have a density, that the problem is the same. Uh, now there's a slight issue. Let's see what I've got for time. I have like a minute. Uh, 
Yeah, we, we assume that S is a density, but we may want to only assume that the union has a density. And uh, so we're just going to ask the question really quick. Is it true that S has a density if and only if that union has a density? And it turns out that uh, this time, it, yeah, yes, it's true. Uh, it The proof works because one plus a half plus a third is less than two, which is kind of fun. So the proof would fail if you added on like five and seven or something like that. Uh, the proof is annoying, but easy. Uh, basically, you just use binomial theorem or coefficients of Dirichlet series to uh, reconstruct s from uh, s of x from r of x here, and then uh, show that your error terms are negligible compared to x in the limit. Uh, so when when either density does exist, this proof also shows that uh, the density of of s and the union r are in the ratio of six to eleven. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to give it over to Drake, who is going to uh, take us into the Wild West, basically. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay, I can see your screen. Great. Uh, is it in slideshow mode now? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Um, let me start my timer so I have a sense of what I've got. Okay, great. So now, um, oh, right, it is, let's see. Um, oh, right, I have not paused it, there we go. Okay, so now um, we're trying to find- um, uh, I can no longer see it. Uh-oh, let's fix that. Okay, right, there we see. go, let's see. Did we move to a slideshow again successfully? Yes. Great. So um, now that we aren't guaranteed um, a general density of the limit, we're looking for the highest upper density. Um, so we take the limb soup of this ratio of elements up to n. Um, and as has been foreshadowed before, um, these densities don't necessarily have this nice ratio anymore um, because for a given n, they're not necessarily going to take up sort of the corresponding fractions of, of the integers up to n. Um, so we sort of have to ask these questions about S and R separately from each other because we don't have some nice relationship between their densities anymore. Um, so um, to, to pursue this, um, we're going to look at the case of R first. Um, and we're going to sort of fix some very large number N, where very large means kind of as large as we need for our purposes to be defined later when we want to like handle a bunch of epsilons and deltas. Um, and then we're going to see how many how many elements up to n we can fit into our set. Um, so R, this this union s, 2s, and 3s, um, which before could be at most 11 twelfths, has um, an optimal upper density, which is different and a little bit larger than that. Um, so some of you may already be guessing this because I think it's it's pretty obvious, um, but it turns out to be exactly 108,733 over 117,936, um, which you know. It's it's really a pretty trivial observation, um, you know, kind of kind of falls right out of the question statement. Um, but yeah, so what's going on here? Um, how do we how do we get such a ridiculously exact rational number out of this? Um, so uh, let's get into it. So once we've chosen a very large number n, um, what do we do? Um, as we did before, we're going to um, look at these seeds um, that sort of generate this little like two D um, grid of powers of two and powers of three. And sort of within that grid, we can sort of things interact with each other and outside of it, everything is independent. So we can sort of focus our focus our attention just on um, each of these seeds and maximize them um, on their own. And then um, once we've done that, we'll, we'll sort of add everything back together and see how many elements we've found up to n. Um, and importantly, here we don't care about density. So we can just, you know, if we do something that sort of screws us over between n and 1.5 n, that's fine because we don't need to keep the density the same. So we can sort of, we, we give ourselves some more freedom um, to, to sort of be, be greedy and maximize things right near n um, without worrying about what happens a little bit further. Um, and just as a note, sort of, if we do make mistakes somehow, we can kind of, we aren't permanently, we haven't permanently screwed things up. So by the time we get to like a thousand end or something, we can perform the same strategy again, which means that we'll be able to hit that density again and again and again, and therefore actually have that as a limit, as a limb sum, and not just a one-time maximum density. Okay, so just as a quick example, um, if n were 12, I guess if n were 11, um, 
then we'd have four different groups here, one of them large, and then th these other groups. Um, so um, we're looking at R here, this union of S, 2S, and 3S. And then geometrically, sort of what are we doing? Well, R consists of these kind of L shapes, where the element of S is in the corner, and then we sort of get these branching off um, elements to the right and above it. And these L shapes can't overlap. So we're sort of trying to cram these things into this quadrant um, in a way that, that maximizes the number of elements. Um, so if we fix a given seed, um, then sort of this packing problem that we're trying to solve um, happens within only the integers that are up to n over a. So for instance, if n is 100 and a is 5, um, then we've sort of We've got these these elements in our in our group arranged in this in this in this sort of two D form, um, and we're trying to fit L shapes into into this block that looks kind of like the the numbers up to eighteen um, within our previous diagram. So we can just directly solve this, and it turns out that we can get all but one of these cells filled. Um, so this would correspond to. Um, I guess uh, eight of the nine elements in this group all being within our set, um, and then the ninth one couldn't be, and, and we know that that's sort of the best we can do. Um, so, before our our record setting R sort of looked like this in terms of a packing, um, but it turns out that we can pack these L shapes better than this in the limit. So, um, in general, if we have a seed, um, then we're going to have to tile sort of all of the all of the squares in this diagram whose values are up to up to k if, if a is between n over k plus one and n over k. Um, as, as with as with five there, sort of we had we had to tile everything up to 100 over five, which is 20. Um, so this means about the upper density is that um, if we if we say that tk is the number of L shapes that we can pack into one of these sort of um, looks kind of like a young tableau shape things, um, then we're just going to have fraction of numbers up to n, i.e. just this the difference between these two bounds um, times dk. And then we have this one third factor because only one third of the numbers in that range in the limit are actually these seeds. Um, so the idea is that if we can find out um, a, a nice series of numbers tk that describes um, how many L shapes we can fit into each of these sort of blob shapes, um, then we'll be able to extract this upper density. Um, so at the very least, this sort of gives us a computational approach because if we just brute force computed this thing for the first 100 TKs, we would get some good approximation um, to the upper density because we'd have- And we did do that. Yes. Um, so hopefully sort of our, our game plan looks clear now. We've converted this problem of, uh, that looked kind of number theoretic into some question about like packing lots of geometric shapes um, on a grid. Um, on the other hand, it's not clear how we would actually do this because like these blobs look kind of ugly and they're gonna have weird boundary conditions and it seems like it wouldn't be very easy to, um, to get it nicely. So um, we have something that maybe would be bold to call it conjecture, but we have a hope at least. And this hope is that um, the best R looks like something simple and nice, except for some, some manageable amount of cases that we can deal with. Um, so what sort of, what would a good R look like? What would a good way to pack these L shapes into, into this quadrant look like? Well, um, if K is big, um, then we've sort of got this very large region. So we're just trying to sort of get the maximum density, give or take boundary conditions of these Ls. Um, and luckily, they tile the plane perfectly. So it seems like we can probably get density one. Um, unfortunately, this tiling does not fit into a quarter plane nicely. You will, you will run into, into boundary issues. So sort of the best we can hope for, in a sense, is something like this, where we've sort of outside of the boundary of our quadrant, we're good, but then we still have some of these holes on the sides. So effectively, our goal is to show that we can't sort of these holes are as are as good as we can do. We can't hope to have fewer holes than this. Um, and then we'll be able to just default to this sort of nice value of R, which we're calling R naught from now on, um, in most of the cases. So um, more formally, this is just the set where um, we have power of two times power of three times A, where A doesn't have any factors of two or three. And these exponents are um, congruent mod three, and then R follows with that. Um, okay, so this R naught that we had um, has an exact density of 473 over 546. Um, you can compute this if you want. Um, it is 
reasonably straightforward, although I think involves a little bit of cleverness. Um, it's been a while since I worked it out. Um, and note that this is less than 11 twelfths, um, which it should, because this, this sort of nice set that we have does in fact have a density. Um, this thing sort of is nicely behaved. Um, and this is a less than 11 twelfths, which it should be given that we proved it can't be more than that. Um, but we're going to improve it in a few cases. Um, and this will bring us above 11 twelfths. So um, just a quick recap before we launch into the next step. Um, we're trying to find these best translated L shapes um, in these sort of K blobs where we take all of the numbers up to K in this grid. Um, and for each of these, we're trying to optimally sort of cram in the elements, which corresponds to finding these best packings. Um, once we have these packings, we'll have the density if we can just compute some infinite sum. Um, and we're hoping that these best packings will look sort of well behaved in most cases, except for some manageable amount of exceptions. Um, so our next step is to try and find ways to prove that this R naught is optimal. So now we have an actual lemma, um, which is where part of the title alluded to comes in. Um, if we have a Utah shaped region that is pressed up against the X or Y axis, so it's on the borders of this, of this quadrant, um, then um, any way that we try and tile this sort of five celled region must leave at least one of those cells with a hole. Um, so the proof is um, not hard if you're willing to buy this. Um, you can try it a bunch and believe that, in fact, you cannot do this without leaving a hole somewhere. Um, so um, now we kind of have a sketch of a path that we could follow. We sort of draw these just shapes onto our optimal R naught, and we say, "Oh, look! Sort of in each of these, in each of these Utah shapes, we have exactly one hole. So sort of if we have some large blob shape, um, then we're going to have these spots where we need to have at least one hole, and we do have exactly one hole." So we've sort of got as few, um, it seems like we'll have roughly as few as, as we want to. Um, and, and maybe we could prove that it's optimal. Um, but the problem here is that sort of in this corner, we've got two holes where maybe we might only need one um, by, by having sort of these, this vertical and horizontal u shapes overlap. Um, so we introduce another lemma whose proof is just computational and bashy um, that um, this 243 blob it turns out you can't pack it any better than with these four holes. So this sort of gives us our sort of below this we'll have some sporadic exceptions, and then above this we'll have this sort of more regular case where we know that we have to have at least four holes in this thing, and then past that the Utah shape will also have, to have at least one hole. Um, so just restating this. Um, so the sort of sketch of what this looks like for some large k, so for ID, ID for some small seed. Um, is that as we're, as we're trying to pack in these L shapes, um, we need to have four holes down in the corner and then one in each of these Utah shapes. Um, the green region, we know that we've filled completely. So we know that we can't possibly do any better than that. Then sort of these yellow regions, we have, we have holes, we have elements that we haven't filled up, um, but we know that we have, to, we have to have at least that many holes. So sort of we know that we can't do any better. And then the only things we need to worry about are kind of these, these boundary conditions where we might have a Utah shape that is partially filled. Um, by our, by our K blob. And the shape here is just indicating that these things sort of are, are monotonic. The, the steps only go um, up and to the left of, of the boundary here. Um, so if we have a vertical Utah shape, and I'm kind of just zooming in on this previous um, region, looking at, looking at, this, top, um, at this top object, um, what's going to happen? Well, um, the way these are positioned, um, our, our R naught tiling is going to put an L in the bottom left corner and then another one above here. And x here will be some power of three um, because it's pressed up against the left side. And we sort of fill the first four, um, the first four of these five elements um, as we encounter them. So if our blob includes just x, then we'll have filled all one of it. If it includes x and two x, we'll have filled two out of two, and so on. And the only time that we'll introduce a hole is if we actually include all five, but then we know that we have to have that hole. So sort of until we get to this last element of this Utah shape, um, we'll have filled up every single one of these elements. And so we know that we can't do any better because we're not leaving any holes until we're sort of forced to um, by our limits. So we're good on that front. Um, and then we want to say, oh, well, you know, just reflect this and we'll be, we'll be good on the horizontal front, which is what the proof originally was. Um, but this breaks because three is larger than two and thus four and the six is larger than four citation needed. Um, and so the problem here is that if we have one, two, three, sort of x, two x, three x, and four x, but not six x in 
um, in this blob, then our default packing is going to look like this. Um, and we're sort of we're going to leave this for uncovered when it would be possible to have it covered by sort of moving this L shape down into the right and plugging that hole instead and translating that that sort of necessary hole in these five cells to the one that our that our blob doesn't encounter yet. Um, so we have a problem when we're between 4x and 6x. Um, but we can just straight up move this thing and it's fine. Sort of the only thing that it interferes with is anything above and to the right of that, but we we've already assumed that that's not within sort of the scope of our of our shape that we're trying to fill. Um, so we have this case where things go wrong, but to fix it, we just directly do this translation and then everything's fine. So um, we've now identified the cases where our nice lattice back fails. Um, less than 243, we have some sporadic exceptions. And then above 243, we have this range where um, that's referring to x here will always be um, of the form 2 to the 3k um, because it's down in this bottom row and they repeat every three. And then being between 4x and 6x just means being between 4 times 2 to the 3n and 6 times 2 to the 3n. So um, now we, we have we sort of exactly characterized these cases. Um, and in both of these cases, we're only off by one. So the former cases just requires checking that, in fact, um, you never managed to, to do more than one better than, than this sort of R naught that we that we started out with. OK. Um, so now we're going to start with our, with our nice lattice. And then we're going to add on sort of these bonus terms that we get from the cases when we can do better. So um, the sporadic cases look like these ones. Um, sort of these are the blobs that we can pack better than we can with our with our R not packing. Um, and so this corresponds to these values of k, but it actually corresponds to these sort of ranges of k because if say k is 11 or k is 10, that's both that's going to give us the same um, the same actual shape that we that we're trying to pack here. Um, so we have these values of k. So this is you know between n over nine and n over 12. Um, we're going to have um, we're going to be able to do better. And likewise, for all these other ranges, if we union them together, we get this range. Um, so now we're just turning this back into our original formula. Um, so if we have, we have this upper density as the sum of this, this function of these TKs. And the TKs are sort of this, this gross series of things. But we happen to know that our upper density of R0 um, is equal to this sum for its values of TK. And then our remaining sum is just sort of the, the leftover bits. So these are these are only the, the amount of extra holes that we can fill. So we've got the density of R0 plus um, this sum of 1 over k minus 1 over k plus 1 over these two ranges from our sporadic um, exceptions. And then this infinite sum across um, these ranges where we can fill one extra hole. If there was if there was some k for which we could fill two extra holes, then there would be a coefficient of 2 in this sum. Um, so now we're just going to telescope these sums. Um, and we collapse them sort of to their endpoints um, because they, they nicely cancel like that. And then we reduce this. Oh, hey, that's a geometric series. We know how to do that sum. Um, and now we have a whole bunch of fractions. And if we add them all up together, we get this massively complicated result in the end. Um, so I guess first, if anyone has any immediate questions, um, this might be a good place to take some of them. Otherwise, we can move on to some um, further uh, further research, pictures. right? Mm. Yeah. Hi, hi, Drake. It was uh, a good talk so far, at least. Um, so yeah, I had I had one question that maybe I'll ask now, uh, which is: say I was interested in the finite problem, like what's the largest subset of the integers one up to n that you can maximize these things for? Is your technique with the upper density, will that solve that too? Uh, yeah. So I think that'll give you, yeah, this will give you an exact answer for any given n um, with the same approach. Um, because, yeah, sort of to solve it, to solve the density exactly, you kind of have to solve the problem for any finite n because, you know, like n equals 100, a equals 5 or something corresponds to sort of everything where your seed is roughly 5% of n in the limit, because kind of you're, you're doing the same things if it's 5% or 5.01%, because there's still like a through 19a or something you have to deal with. Um, and so to get the limit right, you kind of have to get 
every every like range um, up to n correct, which therefore sort of gives you it for any given finite n. So yeah, you could you could apply the same thing to get it for n, and I think it would just be yeah, I don't know if it would turn into something super nice, but you could certainly like compute it easily with like a for loop that just runs at O of n time. Yeah, I mean, you program the sporadic exceptions that we were talking about. You just hard code those in, and then for larger n, you just check if it's in a range of the type that we mentioned before. And it's very easy to calculate the uh, number of elements in this R not tiling that we used. Uh, so just it, it's basically the same idea as here. It's uh, yeah, it, it, it wouldn't like be truncate this sum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We should probably look and see if that sequence is in the OAS. My guess is it won't be, but which maybe. which one? The for each n, the maximum number of L shapes you can fit up to n. Oh, absolutely not. It's not in there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then my other hopefully quick question was uh, this tableau that that appears when you like chop the, the grid off at a certain k. What's what's the shape of that? Is it like a line or is it circular like you had in your? Uh, it's, it's, I think it looks like a line with, it's going to be sloped like log two of three or log three of two okay. or something. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically a big triangle. The, the, the drawing that we did that showed it as a very circular region took a lot of artistic liberty. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that was a little bit misleading. Um, but, uh, yeah, because they, because it's like two to the A times three to the B equals N give or take. So. Mm. But you're plotting it on sort of this log plot, so that'll that'll look like just a, mm. a linear sum of things. Okay, sure. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any, Any other, other questions? questions? Oh man, we even have like a whole two minutes or something left. I know it's crazy. We timed it so perfectly. You want you want to talk about a uh, future? Yeah. Future questions. Um, feel free to chime in with anything that I missed in this mm. section. Okay, so. We were looking at R before, the union of S2, S, and 3S, but we could look at S instead. What's what's the best density of that? Um, and as far as we can tell, um, this is just like some random crappy irrational number. Um, so we're, we're solving a similar kind of problem, um, which is where we're, we're packing in these L shapes, but we're trying to maximize the number of corners that fit in there rather than the number of, of squares total. Um, and the problem is that like this just doesn't seem very well behaved. Like, um, we've computed it out for a fair, for um, a while, um, and we've got like yeah, I found some patterns. digits of the of the thing, but yeah, no, um, I've got like fifteen or twenty digits at this point. Yeah, um, and it doesn't seem to sort of behave nicely enough that we can turn it into some kind of collapsible infinite sum. Like our our trick in in this R case was that we like had we had a few sporadic exceptions and they were all of some like manageable form that we could convert into if we'd fold this infinite sum somehow um but as far as we can tell there just like are no such nice patterns um with s um and in general we can one two and three are constants we could pick different constants um so the general <laughs> problem that we would like to but have not solved um is if we have some some arbitrary series of of sort of coefficients here um, and we have S such that those scaling factors make it, make it disjoint, um, then we ask the same question. Um, and one, two, three is kind of the most natural non-trivial case you could answer. I don't know offhand what you get with one, two, but I don't think it's interesting. Um, with, with what? One, one, two, I think it's just boring. Yeah, no, one, two is just geometric. You just get like, uh, four to the N times odd numbers. Sure. That sounds like or something like that. Yeah. Um, and in general, we don't have exact answers here, but we do have a conjecture, um, which is that the upper density of S is bounded by the inverse of the, I guess this is sort of like the harmonic, yeah, this is the harmonic mean of T. Um, no, it, it, harmonic mean is slightly different. Oh, right, because you divide by N, yeah. Um, harmonic. Harmo oh, there, inverse harmonic sum. Yeah, yeah. In, just, just inverse harmonic sum. Um, and know that like this doesn't necessarily give a tight bound. For one thing, um, it could give you a, an upper bound that is larger than one, um, but <laughs> it still seems it is still strong enough that we don't know how to prove it. Um, I don't think do we have any conjectures on exact values? I think we basically don't, um, even in the For, case. Yeah, no. Uh, I I feel like uh, any exact like tight bound that we get is just massively complicated in any non-trivial case. 
Um, we, we actually do have a proof of this, this big conjecture in the case that this inverse sum of elements in T is infinity and the elements in T are relatively prime. So we have a proof of that. It's it's very it's actually a really nice proof. It uses like probabilistic method and stuff. It's great. When Griffin says we he means Griffin has a proof of this. Um, <laughs> fully crock it. Um, I think that is everything we have. Yeah. So and any 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 last questions? Okay, then let's go ahead and thank our speakers. Um, thanks for the great talk. Um, I think our next talk is like in three minutes. Yeah, th right. thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. I, I take it from the from the post talk silence that everyone had perfect comprehension, which is exactly. All that's always what it means. I guess um, <clears throat> I have a quick question, but then maybe then the next speakers can get set. Um, Sounds good. Okay. Is there a? Did you? Is there any like literature on these kind of packing? I mean, packing problems is a thing, but these L shapes in the bigger shapes, was it, that related that to anything you saw in the literature or were it Not that we've been able to find. It's okay. possible that I'm just using the wrong keywords or something, but like, you know, the sequences that you would get from this don't seem to be in the OAS. Sure. Um, yeah, as, yeah. as far as we can tell, it's not a thing that people have really looked at before. Okay. For, for, for the problem itself, especially this big conjecture, there's actually an old like Erdish reference uh wow. yeah he uh so so instead of assuming disjointness you assume disjointness and uh the union is exactly equal to the natural numbers mm -hmm. so he 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 call he calls that like a pair of direct factors of n uh and then you can actually prove using only those assumptions that not only do both sets have defined densities that they are exactly equal to this bound that's in the big conjecture so it's it's not bounded above, but it has to be exactly equal. So it's uh it's interesting for sure. So sadly the methods just completely fail trying to prove this though. All right. Uh I guess we can stop sharing and uh yeah, we gotta we gotta move over, don't we? Mm-hmm. <laughs>